Well, hi, good morning. Thank you for joining me here. Today is November 20th on a very snowy day here. Okay, we're not like Buffalo. Buffalo is buried in five, even six feet or more of snow, which is a disaster. We've only got maybe a foot and a half, maybe 25 centimeters here. About that much, about that much snow. But more is coming. So uh, the same, the same way uh, Buffalo has been buried by a streamer coming across the length of Lake Erie. Uh, we can get buried here by streamers coming down from uh, Georgian Bay. But uh, right now there is a streamer and it's about five miles, or uh, say seven or eight. It's between Aurelia and Barrie right now. And if it drifts north, then we could see the same snow rates that uh, Buffalo saw for, but I'm not worried. Not worried here about the snow because I don't plan to go out today. Look at this radio I've got to work on. Now this radio made an appearance in my last video, or one of the last videos, um, and I uh, didn't do anything with it except take a look at it. So we're, we're going to kind of repeat that only a little faster now that I've had a look at it. And I have this uh, fantastic uh, manual, um, which, the, uh, which, which I have with this radio. I own this radio. And I'm going to start off with a little bit of a mystery as to what is Okay, that phone call turned out to be a wrong number. Okay, now, one of the initial mysteries with this radio, uh, when I looked at it, is what is going on here? What, what is this this panel here? It's a very odd looking thing. It doesn't just doesn't look right. Uh, obviously, it's got the meter right in the middle of it. It's got a, a big uh, helicrafter symbol on it. So it's not some homemade jury rig thing. It's got this weird knob that can't be the right knob. The knob's supposed to look like this. And it has a control here without a knob. So I think the answer can be found by looking at this picture. So in this picture, this is the speaker. Look, there's the same Hallicrafters uh, symbol. This is the speaker. But in this radio, the speaker is mounted up here in the, in the, uh, in the lid. There he is. If you go a little further into the manual, you can find this. Installation and operating instructions for the model SM40 tuning meter. There's the meter. So what's happened here is, I think when this model originally came out, uh, it was like you see it, but with the speaker here. And you could pick up this unit separately. They would sell this to you. And you would plug it into this radio. Um, and then later, I'm guessing, somebody said, you know, we can incorporate this right in the radio. If we just just leave everything the same, just move the speaker up here, and we'll have space, we can put a panel in here, and voila. And that's what I think has happened with this version of So this would be a later version than is in this manual. How different would it be electronically? Probably not. Probably not at all. So the interesting thing about this meter, flip around the back, curious thing. So since the meter was originally a, an external option, you would buy your external meter and it would come with this cord and plug, which you would plug in, and voila. What would you believe? The way this radio is done, even with that panel in the front, they still utilize this plug with this cable. But look, someone has cut this cable. Why? Why? <laughs> Why did somebody do that? That's a big mystery. These wires hanging out the back turn out to be speaker wires, speaker extension wires. Don't know what that is yet. And th this piece here is simply the end of the shaft on the band switch from the front. So there's a long metal shaft traveling through the uh, entire uh, chassis and it's just supported at the back here. This is the bearing for this switch here, the band switch, which of course probably has a number of wafers, quite a number of wafers in it. Radio has some nice features. Uh, it has this band spread, which you could kind of think of as a little squeaky there. You could kind of think of as fine tuning. I'm afraid you're seeing the reflection of my, 
my uh, shirt on here. Um, and then it has the main the main tuning dial, great big dial. It's got one, two, three, four bands, and this is an index band here for making notes of where you're picking things up. And let's see, what other interesting features does it have? We'll just run through the controls this way. So it's got a standby and receive switch. Uh, this could be used by a ham radio operator. We would have a transmitter uh, separate from this. And when he went to transmit, he would want to flip this on standby while he transmits and then back on to receive. A little awkward. This is the pitch control for the VFO. This is the on off switch and tone control. High tone, medium tone, low tone. Noise limiter, uh, very common on radios of this vintage because of the uh, problem with uh, car ignition noise, which was uh, common back then. And the noise limiter is a very simple uh, feature, just cutting off the uh, noise peaks in a signal. So you have a signal coming along, but it has these blips in it, bip, bip, from ignition noise or something like that. And they, they just trim it off with this very common circuit. This is a switch from CW or uh, continuous wave or Morse code operation or single sideband, whatever way you want to call it, or AM. Flip it over to AM. I have a switch here for AVC on and off. That's very interesting. That That is very helpful. Switching off the AVC on a communications receiver can make listening much more pleasant. They switch this off you become in control of the RF gain of the receiver, and that's what this knob is over here. This is RF gain. This guy, well, got to be a volume control somewhere, and here it is, the volume control. Uh, pretty nice. If you have this on a table or something, or your hands are right in here, that's pretty good. Okay, you're not lifting up your arms up here to tune. Um, Usually when you're listening to shortwave or, or investigating radio signals, you want to have a hand on the volume control and a hand on the tuning control. And that's about it. So this one over here is labeled sensitivity as opposed to RF gain, but that's what it is, RF gain. Model S40A. Okay, that's about it for the front. If you look at the back again everything more to see. It has the uh, antenna inputs here uh, for a long wire antenna or a uh, say a dipole antenna either way you can just change this link here to suit. Now the really interesting thing or one of the interesting things about this electric unit union made fabrication label union made I think they're talking about the cabinet um, what's interesting, what I want, no, that's not what's interesting. What's interesting is down here. This uh, Halicrafters radio was actually made by Rogers Majestic Corporation in Toronto or, or Montreal. I don't know which city it was made in. Manu says right there, manufactured by Rogers Majestic Limited. Rogers is a company which still exists today here in Canada. It's a super well known company here. They're the big, one of the big cable companies in Canada. So I, in fact, uh, I uh, sub subscribe to the Rogers cable system. My telephone runs, my, my cell phone runs on the Rogers system and that. Um, the Majestic part, it was another company that Rogers purchased. They either purchased or they got entitled to use the word Majestic. So a lot of early, Rogers made a lot of uh, radios in the uh, late 20s through the 30s many many radios uh, not uh, communications radios but uh, uh, radios for your home and uh, the majestic name was uh, very desirable so they acquired it one way or another it's a very complicated history for all these radio companies back then it was a cutthroat business a lot of money to be made first end gets the money that kind of stuff guy holding the patent gets the money Pretty exciting time, I think. This is a later. This is this is post-war, 1947, 48, somewhere like that. 
Um, so I, what I was just talking about was actually earlier, in the late 20s, and maybe through the 20s and into the 30s. Pretty cutthroat business. So this is on a nice piano hinge. We can just open it right up and lay it right back like that. And we can peer inside. We are peering inside now. So um, a lot of tubes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine tubes in this this guy. The capacitor has three sections. That's an important observation. Uh, a lot of radios have only two sections: a, uh, a local oscillator and an antenna tuning section. This one has three. That makes it a better radio for sure. Now I'm going to be repeating some of the things I said in the other vi video, just in case you who are watching this video did not see the last one I posted because it actually is labeled on another radio. Down here is uh, various adjustments for alignment and someone has labeled them C4, C2, C3. That's going to be helpful. This is the, the cable that goes to the, uh, to the meter. Wow, it's kind of, it's kind of, why'd they feed it out here? They should, I mean, the meter's over here. They should have fed it around that way. Out. But anyway, it's way over here for some reason. Um, big flywheel, a heavy flywheel, but this is on the uh, uh, band spread tuning. That's just a little odd. Um, three IF cans. There are two or three IF amplifier tubes in here. I can't remember now. We'll look at the schematic in a minute. But that bodes very well for this radio. The IF frequency is only 455. And the tuning range goes all the way up to 42 megahertz. So I would expect some serious problems with image rejection. Uh, similar to what I was experiencing with the, uh, the last radio I was working on. But it could be that these tremendous IF, I don't want to call it, filtering band band pass band pass tightness <laughs> you know has a very very tight IF I guess put it that way a small bandwidth of IF maybe that compensates substantially if we look at this meter arrangement here on the back it looks it looks pretty thrown together to me it doesn't look like it was done in a factory well maybe a person could buy a kit and it could replace the speaker panel on the front themselves. Put the speaker up on the panel at the top. How much you want to bet? This is the panel. This is the original panel from the front. Want to make a bet? You have to drill some holes to put this up here. But that could be the case. This is actually a kit. It, it just doesn't look like factory type stuff. Especially when you know, look at this, this, this crazy arrangement here. So somebody did this. This is maybe to enable these wires to come out the back for another speaker. And we've got a, well, they got up there. Yeah, this is this weird. I have to get a different camera to show you this, but this control, uh, being the cautious person I was, I'm not cautious anymore. <laughs> I, I thought, well, this is going to be some kind of potentiometer, right? And I started turning it, and it just had a weird feel to it. But it turns out it's actually two switches. And they're related to the speaker, and I think the headphone uh, jack down here. Oh. <laughs> Apparently somebody wants some attention. Uh, we're just about finished looking through this, I think, anyway. So uh, I can... Hello, I hear you. Yes, sir. What? He wants to go somewhere. You got no food upstairs? Is it the food problem? He wants me to make the snow go away. Bring spring, spring back. So what I'm going to do next, uh, I'm going to uh, withdraw, I'm going to somehow get the uh, chassis out of this cabinet. Somehow is a word. Looks like the front has to come off. Looks like it. 
we'll get the chassis out, I want to look underneath it, and then we'll make a decision about whether to plug it in and turn it on. Okay, cat, I'm coming. Once again, you've cut, you've cut my video short, buddy. While I was dealing with my cat, I looked out the window and the snow was really picked up now. Uh, so this huge snowfall has struck uh, Buffalo. Uh, here you are here. Uh, this looks out of date to me. Let me just click this here. There we go. So Buffalo is right under... Oh, down here. No wonder I got it wrong. Wrong lake. <laughs> I should study the map before I put it on the screen. So here, here's Buffalo, right, right in this area here, right at the end of Lake Erie. And you can see the streamer has stopped here. There's something going on down here. Now, if you're not in an area of the world where snow streamers uh, occur, this is what happens around here. So here's Lake Ontario. You can see a large streamer heading off this way. And here's why I'm looking at this. This is where I live here in Aurelia. And you can see the streamer. I zoomed in too far maybe. You can see a streamer coming along through here off of Georgian Bay, one of the uh, Great Lakes. And there's not too much hitting Aurelia. It's mostly, this is uh, about say 15 kilometers down to here. And this is a fairly large city of Barrie here which has been getting buried by snow for the last few days but not as much as Buffalo. But these have the potential to do the same. Um, the, the one over Lake Erie can be bigger and more powerful. At this time of year, the lakes have no ice on them, so it's all open water up here. And uh, look, at, look at this one. This one's actually starting way up in here. And it's like a, a, you could think of this like a river in the sky. And that's what's happening in Aurelia. Okay, just needed, you know, I'm Canadian, so I'm just so caught up in the weather. Apparently that is a trait of Canadians. They pay a lot of attention to the weather. <laughs> Weather's very complicated in the Great Lakes region. Uh, as I just showed you, just 15 miles away, there's a blasting snowstorm going on. And there's only a, a moderate storm here right now. Okay, enough talking about snow. I said I was gonna get this out of the cabinet, but I didn't. So let's take a look at how we're gonna do that. So it looks like you might have to take off this front panel, but you know, look at this, it's attached, front panel is attached, all these are attached. It's much more likely that the front panel stays on the radio, stays on the chassis, and this comes off somehow. Let's take a look underneath. What secrets are underneath here? Rogers Majestic Limited. I swung this panel open on the last video and what it exposes are just holes for you to put your tuning tool through to do the alignment. You can see some of the labeling that somebody did previously. Looks like a screw missing there, screw missing there, screw missing here. Hmm. We have an odd screw here, an odd screw there. And screw there. I would say if we uh, take all these screws out up on the side here too and the whole front will slide out of the cabinet with the chassis on it. That's what I would say. There's a little number here. 680 Oh that's interesting. 680088 or is it 880 089. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know what that means anyway. Okay, just trying to spot anything I need to spot before before I make the mistake. I think that's the name of the game. So while I got it up on its side, I'm gonna take these screws out. Now obviously somebody else has had these out. Well, why didn't they put them back in? Are they like me? They lose track of everything? Or they took them out and this thing was apart for a long time? took them out and uh, somebody else put it back together. Hard to say. I mean, look at this one. This one's a, this is a machine screw. This is a self-tapper. They couldn't make up their mind. That, that screw looks beat up. Looks 
like somebody waste war on it. Oh boy. Yikes. Yeah, it's really, it's a... Uh, Hmm. So somebody's allowed their uh, screwdriver to grind out the middle of that screw. Sometimes a flathead screw will fit in enough to uh, get a grip on it. It's a small screw though. No. Or am I wrong and it's actually a square? Is it a square? Maybe it's a square. It's a square. Okay, Roberts screw driver. Okay, and then we got a couple on the side here. Really wasn't planning on putting this part on video, but there we go. Corner's not matching very well here. Screws in on a funny angle. Who did this? Who did this? Somebody slapped it back together quickly. They slapped it back together because they were fed up with it. I had enough of this radio. Slapped it back together and sent it on its way. Who knows the history? Now I think. I should be able to pull this guy right out now. Sounds easy. A little bit of a deal with the speaker here. There we go. stand back for this. Not moving. Okay, must be some more screws in it somewhere. They're also is all different screws in here. I would just remove the entire lid. How's that, how would that help? I don't think that would help at all. Look underneath it again. Did I miss something down here? Uh, there's a chance. These feet are going into the chassis. Okay, I got this one. Well, we'll take them out. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess it does. Sure doesn't look like it. How come you won't come out, Mr. Radio? Don't think there was any instructions on here in here about how to do any of this kind of stuff. What's holding it back? Well, is it possible that maybe this foot's not going in the chassis? Maybe these are. not look like it. Uh oh, somebody else put it. 
different screw in there. This won't go deep enough. But it is a different screw. Oh, now I just felt the chassis come loose. Oh, boy, did it ever, <laughs> ever come loose. Okay, it was the feet. Just not the front feet. Might as well leave that one on. Just leave everything like that. This is a rivet. Okay, now everything's kind of loose and shaky here. One foot on. I did say that. Didn't I? It's not this one up here, though. Oh boy. She wants to come out badly. Something is holding it back here. What could it possibly be? This is pretty tight here. wedging. Well, I guess it was just wedging. Okay, leave this wire up. And cut the speaker wire off. So the wire is loose. Okay, big boy, come out of there. It's a pretty heavy radio. this up, transformer side down. Oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, baby. Wow. There's a lot of work in this guy. Holy smokes. I just, there's, nobody's done anything down here. Oh my gosh, look at that. Look at all those capacitors. Oh boy. Let's do a quick count here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and probably three more I didn't see. Maybe twenty. Twenty capacitors. Wow. Now what kind of can they don't they don't look horrifying, but that doesn't mean much. This is the one microfarad here. It's a 25 microfarad electrolytic one down here. The actual filter capacitor is up here. It's a metal can type. So it might be okay. Might be okay enough. Here's a capacitor. Well, I think. I believe this is a capacitor down here. This is probably the audio output transformer. It's pretty tiny. So now I'm looking it over for any evidence of work anywhere. People fool around on the top. They probably fool around in here too. Or any evidence of fire, burning, popping, explosions, tears. Some may maybe cried into it because they were so upset. There's quite a few tremors up here. Wow. OK, 
Okay, this looks like a, quite a challenge. Now the question is, should we start this guy up? Take out pieces of metal that are falling out of it. What would that be? This looks like part of the clip. Close the lid. That closes in on a couple of gripping clips. And that's in the cabinet. What do you think? So my my approach to these uh, radios is to try to get them operating to any any degree as quickly as possible. Get them safely operable to any degree. And what I mean by that is to the point where if you touch the antenna or do something like that, you can hear the effect coming out of the speaker. It doesn't have to be receiving signals. It doesn't have to be working much better than that. If it's a dead radio and nothing comes out of it, then I'd be anxious about working on it until the cause of the deadness is found. You know, typically these radios are like a chain. When chains fail, one link fails and the chain is, is no good anymore. Same, same thing in here. One link in here, like a tube. A tube would be a typical example. Tube fails, radio goes dead. Guy's tired of it, I'm fed up with this radio, got a little transistor one now, puts this aside with one fault in it. Years later it shows up here with the same one fault still in it. So if I were to just go ahead and start replacing all these, knowing myself, and I don't think I'm much different than anybody, I would make mistakes doing it as much as I would try not to. I, there's a good chance I would make a mistake and I'd have a radio with a fault in it and a mistake made by me maybe even two mistakes try and sort that out so that's why I, I, I'm really against shotgunning like plugging this into a regular outlet and turning it on may not be the smartest idea either um, you know if something like a resistor pops well that's not the end of the world but if you burn out a coil in a radio like this, uh, you're in deep trouble in terms of making it work after that. So there are situations where that could occur. A short in a vacuum tube or something of that sort. You also have to think about the radio itself, its value, its future, its value to me in this case, and how concerned I am with destroying it. Uh, I haven't really destroyed anything. I've done hundreds of radios. I don't think I've ever really destroyed one. But I have had one or two radios that are essentially destroyed from uh, a failure of the power tra transformer in one. It was a big European radio. So, you know, if a part like this goes, then a radio shot. Because the only way to deal with this, well, I, I shouldn't say that. It is possible to find replacements for this, but they would not be exact replacements. You'd have trouble fitting them in. Brand new, you can get them brand new from Hammerland, I think makes a transformer suitable for these high voltage radios, still. So you'd have to hope for, a for one that was close enough. Otherwise, you have to get exactly the same radio and get the part out of it. Um, what, are, what are you doing there? You're just destroying radios one way or another. Okay, so I'm running over this in my head because I'm hesitant and I need to think about this a little bit. Is there anything I'm overlooking? So look at these higher wattage resistors to see if any of them look smoked. But they all look pretty good. In fact, this actually doesn't look like a high mileage radio. So another way to judge the mileage on a radio is to look at the knobs, especially the cabinet right around the knobs particularly where there's wording, to see if there's any sign that they've been worn off by handling. Now, these are pretty large knobs, so you tend to work these knobs without touching. A lot of radios, when you grab the knob, your, your fingers drag on the chassis. And you can see very distinct wear points, uh, especially on wooden cabinets. So this one, I see no evidence on the front of it that it's high mileage. It's been used a lot. It's been run a lot. damage there but that, that could be incidental like 
one one kind damage there. Now I don't really see any image, any any image. I don't see anything giving me that that notion. Be a low mileage radio. Probably has its original tubes. It's going to be full of Rogers tubes. Rogers manufacturing made tubes. And of course that's a big part of the business is selling vacuum tubes. Well, that's a Rogers tube. I don't really want to pull all these out and look at them yet. I want one option is to do the tube testing before turning the unit on. It's not as exciting as turning it on just to see what happens. That's that's more exciting. So if 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 I'm gonna do that, looking for where I would hook up the speaker here. Hmm. The two speaker wires here. One goes off here. There's not. So put the sh shrink tubing. Shrink tubing. Now that, that dates this a little bit. Uh, you know how old is shrink tubing? I don't think it goes back too far. Doesn't the, well? Here's some more shrink tubing here. This is this is a really crazy arrangement. And what is happening here? What is this? This is a cable with three wires in it coming up, and then they three or four wires, and then they uh, bifurcate, or would it be quadrifurcate? Right here. Oh, that's the other end of this. This guy. Well, there's a question right there. Let's pull this out of here. I can assume that if nothing's plugged in here, then nothing bad will happen. This this may have a short in it where the guy cut this. Maybe just have cut it and the wires are shorted. That short plugged in, that's not too good. Um, So if you are going to start something up like this, like I was started to say, you don't want to just plug it in the outlet and let it rip. You really want to restrict the power going into the radio to start with. I have a couple options here for doing that. Um, one of them is this very cool device here. They don't usually use that. Um, very seldom, in fact. Uh, what, what I tend to use is this uh, uh, dim bulb system I've got here. That would restrict the power a lot. Okay, just notice this grommet here is hard and cracked. The uh, capacitor is could be this capacitor is isolated from the chassis. These are observations worth making early on. Looks like every potential contact with the chassis has a, a grommet or something. See for sure what's going on in there. Um, none of these are insulated from the chassis, and this capacitor is not insulated either. All observations worth making. Um, there's some some danger of a shock uh, if those things are isolated, or danger of a mistake in doing part replacement. Take a look at the plug. So the plug has been done in a professional style. See how the wire comes out, wraps around the pin to reach the screw. If if you just bring the wires up and then put them right on the screw and tuck, 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 tuck eventually those wires are going to come together and you're going to have excitement. Now that's a crack there. Yeah, that's a crack. That's terrible. Yeah, that's not going to work very good. That well, might work once. So we're not going to plug it in with this cord. Not there. So let's see. So this is uh, unnecessary. The cord itself is quite flexible. Probably a replacement. Let's look where it goes into the chassis.
pretty good. Inside. Oh, I think this is original. The way this is done. You know, some kind of strain relief there I'm not terribly familiar with. What they've done. They've done something to strain relieve it here. It looks okay. The power wire continues down to this terminal here. And there they are, there and there. This capacitor is running from one output lead from the transformer to this terminal which is riveted solidly to the chassis here. What else have they done for chassis connections? So I see the shield of this wire is soldered down to the chassis. Here's a, another lug onto the chassis. So there's lots of things tied to the chassis. Another important early observation, I would say. I try to become aware of all these things uh, uh, before turning it on. Now what about the power transformer? Has it, has it cooked? It's dark. The compound inside has leaked out to some degree. And these guys are stiff as can be. You cannot bend these at all. If you bend them, break the insulation up here. I mean, start, start going down the rabbit hole. So we don't want to fool around with that at all. See a couple of heavy leads come up to here. This is probably the rectifier tube. It has only a few connections to it. Four connections. So two heater and it's probably, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, Y3. The possibility with these radios when you get them on your bench for the first time is that, yeah, they're full of tubes, but you know what, they're not the right tubes. Somebody didn't like the empty sockets and had some tubes and shoved them in. So before turning it on, it's probably worth, it's probably worth doing the tube testing, in fact, because that way I examine every tube and find out if any of them are dead right from the start. This is probably the output tube here, this big guy. Six F six. This is the output tube. Rogers made made for Rogers. So we don't know who actually made this. Canada. Made in Canada. Well, I grew up in a little town, a little town called Beamsville. I lived on Central Avenue. And if you just went. There was like a row of four or five houses. I was in one of them. And then there was a bit of an industrial land and then a high school. And that industrial land had a factory on it. And they made nuts and bolts in that factory. But round about 19, I don't know, 70 something, they built another small brick building, uh, like a cement block building, right adjacent to it. I started manufacturing vacuum tubes in it. And from what I understand, it was one type of military vacuum tube, but I really don't know. So just up the road from me, in the, still in the early 70s, was a vacuum tube factory beside a nut and bolt factory. The other heavy industry in my town was a basket factory. <laughs> yeah. Well, I lived in the fruit belt where there was a lot of fruit being grown, so it had to have a lot of baskets. And, uh, Beamsville had the basket factory. Okay, decision made. I'm going to pull out, test all these tubes, find any that are bad, replace them, and then ponder more about turning it on. I think, I think that's probably the best way to go. It's nine tubes. That's a lot of work right there.